Good morning, and thank you for enjoying it with a six pack, the Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. Let's talk about the Wisconsin Badgers football team again, but this time we're going to get a little negative. Friday's show was all positive, all positive before I leave for vacation. And now we got to get negative. Now that I guess I'm on vacation when you're hearing this. Here are the three position groups with the most to prove this season for the Wisconsin Badgers. Hello, I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the ooh, on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. You can watch this episode on YouTube, all of our episodes of the Scotty Six Pack podcast on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Six Pack, or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, while you're here. Leave a comment, leave a review. Tell me what you think of the Wisconsin Badgers football team this year. What position group do you think is not quite up to snuff this year? Because I got I got three for you. And maybe I am more down on these rooms, at least one of them, than, than others. And my I think I, I think I am putting more emphasis on the room as well as a mm, room of real positional value that is making me less high on this Wisconsin Badgers football team than a lot of others, uh, other Badger fans that create content out here. So let's, let's start with one room that we didn't see much of last year. And that's the tight end room. 2023 left a lot to be desired for the Wisconsin Badgers tight ends. The, the group of Barry Alvarez grandson, Jake Ferguson. Not, not a lot there. Uh, after a season where the t- entire tight end room combined for 268 yards and two touchdown receptions. Now, it is not the fault necessarily of the offensive coordinator is not the fault of the quarterback Tanner Mordecai and Braden Locke to get those tight ends, the ball, because really there wasn't much talent to go around in the tight end room a year ago, which is why I think this is a room that still has a lot left to prove this year. Last year, you lost the room really before it got started. Jack Eschenbach, Clay Cundiff, who ended up announcing his medical retirement, both stepped away from the program unexpectedly before fall camp began. Same thing happened with Jack Pugh. All of a sudden, he was medically retired at the end of the season. He didn't see action in 2023. You, you, you were left with none of your expected contributors in the tight end room in 2023. Well, you now have lost your most senior member of the group after the 2023 season, Hayden Ritchie, who I believe scored a touchdown in a preseason NFL game on Friday. He's trying to stick on an NFL roster or somewhere. And after Hayden Ritchie last year, you had a converted fullback in Riley Nowakowski. And a true freshman in Tucker Ashcraft, who kind of emerged as your number one receiving option at tight end with 86 yards, caught a touchdown in that game against Rutgers. And you had JT Seagreaves, who also exists. That's about it. That's not a lot of production out of a room that historically is a real safety valve for Wisconsin. And and now you have a different offense, a different offensive coordinator, a different offensive philosophy. But Phil Longo typically employs tight ends who get a lot of, of production. It's the same thing with his obsession with slot receivers. Phil Longo loves being able to dominate the middle of the field. You, you simply do not have, if you can get high level athletes to dominate over the middle of the field, you, you are going to outmatch the players that would otherwise cover you. 
So can Wisconsin take advantage of some of these matchups this, this season? I think it's going to be tough again. I, I think this room has a lot <clears throat> to prove. And there's a lot of new faces in this room, a lot done to try to improve the tight end room from a season ago when you were blindsided by losing everything you were expecting to get from there. A lot of new faces, but not a lot of proven talent. You bring in Jackson McGowan, the transfer from LSU. He had committed to Coach Luke Fickle and the Cincinnati Bearcats before the Fickle regime left uh, to take the job at the University of Wisconsin. Jackson McGowan is certainly a better fit than a converted fullback like Riley Nowakowski, but he has no real playing experience aside from special teams. He has real high pedigree as recruit, was the number 25 tight end in the 2023 recruiting class. You also bring in Grant Stack, who was a big get in the 2024 recruiting class. Arguably, your biggest get in the 2024 recruiting class. I believe he was the highest ranked recruit by some of the recruiting services that Wisconsin was able to get into the 2024 class. He was the number 19 tight end in the country in the 24 class, a bona fide four-star recruit. So somebody who I think has real upside at tight end. You also brought in Rob Booker, the 35th ranked tight end nationally in the 2024 class. But for all this pedigree, obviously, and not production to show for it, it begs the question of, well, what do these recruiting rankings tell us about what we can expect from these folks? Because, yeah, I think we're, we're going to see another step up from Tucker Ashcraft, who was a great get as a true freshman in the 2023 class. That was that seems to be a recruiting hit. We, we'll see. It's one season in, and he had a decent year, despite limited opportunities. What about the hit rate for these tight ends overall? Because we have several folks coming in in the 23 class and the 24 class who are highly rated at the position. Well, I, I regret to inform you that tight ends are one of the positions that collectively the recruiting industry is the worst at actually projecting out. Uh, year over year, it's a, it's a position that is inherently difficult to, to project because so, so many of these folks are either good at receiving or good at blocking. You don't find a lot of folks who are actually good at playing a true tight end role, unless you find a guy who is an excellent wide receiver, but happens to hit a weird growth spurt and shapes into a tight end body by his, by his senior year. We usually need tight ends to be quite a bit older before we figure out if they're actually good. It's the same thing that I talked about recently on uh, an episode. Actually, maybe not recently because, oh, no, recently, last week. Um, I talked about an episode of the Snap the Pig Skin podcast that I host with Noah Clark, a show that's linked in the podcast description. If you like the NFL uh, and you would like to hear the weekly NFL news of the week, you should go listen to that. We have our division preview series coming out entirely this week. Uh, we concluded the AFC and NFC North. We have released uh, the six other division previews on that feed wherever you're listening to this podcast. Snap the Pig Skin. I did talk about how even the NFL is not good at projecting who good tight ends are going to be. That's why using a first round pick on a tight end is usually a foolhardy endeavor because you're not going to get great return on investment. You're not going to get a great hit rate on that first round pick. So the Badgers have loaded up with high end recruiting talent. That is good. That's what you should be doing. That doesn't guarantee anything, particularly at this position. There is, there is a lot to prove here. The, the second position, and where I think the Badgers are probably most thin at any position on the roster, and where I think it is going to make this season a lot worse than what other people are predicting. I am comparatively, I think, to many voices down on the Badgers this year. I, I think it will be an accomplishment for them to get back to a bowl game. 
and I'll get into this a little bit more uh, l- later in the week when we do our full season preview and predictions show on Friday. And part of the reason is they really lack talent at defensive line, and that is where you need to make your your money as a recruiter is recruiting defensive line talent. And this program does not have it. Does not have it at all right now. Some of that is because of the losses that you just suffered. Some of it is because of injuries. But overall, this this is a room that has a lot to prove this season. If Wisconsin is going to do much anything more than get to the Duke's Mayo Bowl. I, I don't think there's a more obvious candidate for rooms that have the most to prove than defensive line. I, don't, I do not think there's a more obvious candidate. You lost a lot from last season. You lost Rodas Johnson, who transferred to Texas A&M, 19 total tackles last season, thir- three tackles for loss, had the second most defensive line snaps na- last season for the Badgers. Gio Piaz transferred to LSU, 22 tackles, 0.5 tackles for loss, the third most defensive line snaps for the Badgers last season. You lost TJ Bowlers, who of course played that hybrid edge role, transferred to Cal, appeared in five games last season. You lose other... Guys, role-playing, snaps guys, teams guys, like Gabe Kirchke to Colorado State, Mike Jarvis to Liberty, Darian Varner, who transferred to Cincinnati, who was a guy that I actually was pretty high on. He spent just the one season at uh, UW, three previous seasons at Temple. Uh, I had high hopes for him. He had five tackles, one and a half tackles for loss. Uh, You also lost Tommy Brunner, who transferred to Western Illinois. Ugh. When you're counting up all the snaps lost on the defensive line from a season ago, uh, Donnie Slusher, uh, who writes for Badger Blitz, the rivals Badger site, noted from Pro Football Focus that there were eight players who recorded a grand total of 2,011 defensive line snaps for Wisconsin last year. Four players who combined for 940 of those who are now gone. Rough for Wisconsin. They, they are left uh, on the interior at nose guard with Ben Barton to start, who has not gotten a lot of playing time apart from last season. Now he's a redshirt senior, and he's serviceable, I guess. Don't know if he's much more than that. I don't really know if he's serviceable in in the world where you have this new Big Ten. You really need you you need top end talent if you're going to compete for the conference. You brought in Brandon Lane, transfer from Stephen F. Austin. When this coaching staff knew, realized, oh my God, we need help on the defensive line. They brought in a transfer defensive lineman after spring practice had ended. I know that I kind of sung the praises and talked about getting high end talent, even quality talent at the FCS level and guys like John Pius but on the defensive line. When, when you're, you're really relying on Brandon lane behind other unproven guys like Ben Barton. I don't know if that's it. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see other guys at at the nose, like Jamel Howard. I I was really excited about to, he, he was the first big win of the Luke fickle era from a recruiting standpoint. You beat out Michigan for his services. And he just hasn't cracked into the rotation yet. We're, we're going on. I know it's only year two, but he doesn't seem like he's in a position to play. And and I think you maybe had hoped, and I believe that he was injured for part of camp last year, so that's why that went off the rails. I think you had hoped that maybe Jamel Howard could find his way into the rotation a year ago. And now it doesn't look like he's going to do it again in the second season at Madison, which I think is really tough. Um, On the outside, on the defensive line, Thought maybe you'd be okay with just James Thompson Jr. and Kurt Neal starting there. Uh, but now James Thompson Jr. is injured. Uh, after I went on shows all last week praising 
uh, James Thompson Jr. talking about how excited I was to see him play. Uh, oh, my other mea culpa from <laughs> a few days ago is that I referred to Robert Morris as a Patriot League team. Uh, and I did get someone in my replies telling me that uh, <laughs> they are a Horizon League team, which, yeah, I should <laughs> I shouldn't have made that mistake um, on 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 my own behalf. I, I truly apologize to all members of of the college basketball sickos community there. That's that's on me. Um. So you're, you're left with a pretty bare cupboard after James Thompson Jr. got injured. It's not good. It's really not good at defensive end for the Badgers. You have Cade McDonald, who I think is going to step into this starting defensive end role, I guess, maybe. <laughs> who is a senior who hasn't recorded a tackle for loss. You're bringing in Elijah Hills, another FCS transfer from Albany. And really, this is where the FCS transfer thing really starts to get to me is that you are just, you you are stacking FCS level talent to try to generate pass rush for you, right? Between John Pius, Elijah, um, <laughs> what's said Elijah Wood? Elijah Hills uh, and Brandon Lane a lot of FCS talent you're relying on to, to play against a really hard Big Ten schedule. Uh, and Elijah Hills is probably the next man up in this rotation now. So potentially two former FCS transfers playing uh, starting defensive line snaps. You do have Daryl Peterson, I think, who we mentioned on Friday's pod that looks like he's making the slide out from or in from outside linebacker. Uh, into the line, think he can play a little bit wherever. That's probably helpful for this group, but you know, how much do you want to borrow from other positions to help help your depth problems here? Uh, you really probably just need bodies at this point at, at defensive line. Um, and it's a spot that you have outside linebackers, a spot that you have some bodies to spare that makes sense to bring them over despite you know you are dealing with a little bit with injuries over there too like thomas heiberger uh and aaron witt who is perpetually injured so you you never know if that could become a crisis all of a sudden you have some true freshmen hank weber dylan johnson who who is a recruit that i'm really excited about but i i kind of figured was not gonna be ready for snaps this season it seems that maybe he's gonna be ready to play uh snaps at defensive end for, for the badgers the you know, stand out wrestler in high school who I think has the ability, all, all the coaching staff talks about his ability to generate leverage. And clearly he's really good at it. Um, and you can only uh, imagine that is coming in large part due to his background as an elite wrestler as well. Uh, so, so that's good. Uh, your other true freshman is Ernest Willer, who is also, who has made that slide over in a trade for Daryl Peterson and, and Ernest Willer, I guess is made that slide over to outside linebacker and maybe he comes back here to play defensive end, but I, who knows, who knows you lost a ton of production on the D line at a position that you already weren't that great at. And now one injury and it is just a whole lot of young talent or talent transferring up. It's a lot of questions. It's a lot of question marks. Got to prove it to me. Got something to prove this season. Lastly, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The low-hanging fruit. The quarterback's got something to prove. The quarterback's got something to prove for himself. And I think, I earnestly think that that is what Tyler Van Dyke is, is playing for this season is because he feels like he has something to prove to himself. So what are the Wisconsin batters going to get at quarterback this season? Was naming Tyler Van Dyke, the start of the right move. I, based on their performance in camp between Tyler Van Dyke and Braden Locke, I tend to think that's the case, but what are we going to get from Tyler Van Dyke? Are we going to get something that looks like his red shirt freshman season where he threw for nearly 3000 yards, 25 touchdowns, six interceptions, nine yards per attempt, but he hasn't been nearly as impressive since then as we have all chronicled. He played through a lot of injuries last year, 
by by his own admission and also by Tyler Van Dyke's you know telling of events retelling of events it seems like the staff down in Miami played some weird games with his starting reps in practice and then in games being benched not being benched it just was messy it didn't make sense it didn't make sense it didn't based on the retelling of events from Tyler Van Dyke's perspective it does not read like an environment that was conducive to high level quarterback play not at all also keep in mind that that coaching staff uh blew you a game by not just taking any so there's that too so Tyler Van Dyke has question marks. Is the staff going to come to regret making him the starter, going to find somebody, given that Braden Locke was eh, something close to serviceable a year ago? Certainly not an all-world passer, right? Was struggling to maintain a completion percentage around 50% in, in the few games of action that he had. But I also wouldn't want my quarterback's first start to come against Iowa. And that it did. That's not great. He pushed Tyler Van Dyke in camp, but Tyler Van Dyke certainly seemed to be the better quarterback throughout camp. So now, does Tyler Van Dyke go out there and, and prove it to himself for, for a guy who was pushing to be a projected first round pick at one point in time? He's not going to be that now, but can he get himself? into day three of the NFL draft. Can he do it? Regardless of whose fault it was, the, the center snaps, the offensive coordinator, the receiving talent, because of the tight end talent obviously wasn't there a year ago. I think we all believe that the wide receiver room is better than it was a year ago, at least schematically you know, for the skill set match between player and scheme. No matter whose fault it was, quarterback play was not up to par a season ago. The timing seemed off, but like I watched Tanner Mordecai under throw guys out to the sidelines about 10 times a game. It was hard. It was hard to watch. And so maybe... This is Luke, or not Luke Fickle, sorry, Phil Longo, who really has something to prove here. And maybe it is a little bit of Luke Fickle for bringing in this offensive system with this Achilles heel of, of quarterback play and not totally understanding Wisconsin's place in history, Wisconsin's ability to recruit quarterback talent. And I understand that there is some chicken and egg problem here between being able to recruit quarterback, high-level quarterback talent and having a scheme that attracts high-level quarterback talent. But for, for so long, Wisconsin was this program that it seemed you always felt very solid about its ability to, to compete, at least to compete for the Big Ten West, always get you into bowl games. And you felt like, you know, we, we were a quarterback away from actually putting this program over the top and winning the Big Ten. Well, when you make a transition from being a team with a scheme that is a quarterback away, seemingly at all times, and I understand that you don't want to be a quarterback away at all times. You, you would rather get the guy and hope for the best. But when you're a program that has a track record of not being able to get the guy, implementing an offensive system that requires you to have the guy really to be successful. If you don't get the guy, it's really not fun. It's really not fun. This Wisconsin Badger season last year was not fun. And so the quarterbacks have something to prove. If only to themselves, if only to prove, if only for Tyler Van Dyke to prove maybe I wasn't the guy shooting toward a first round NFL draft grade. Maybe I wasn't that guy, but I'm definitely not an undrafted free agent.
And Tyler Van Dyke can go out and prove that to himself this season. This tight end room with young guys can go out and prove we belong. This defensive line can go out and prove we were brought up here. It's Big Ten football, and we belong. They could do it. I would love to see it. it would sure be fun. But those are the three rooms where I have the most question marks heading into this Wisconsin Badgers football season. Luke Fickle still has work to do on this roster. That's very clear. This is a rebuild still, and it is not done yet. Uh, so that is going to do it for today's episode of the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. We will be back in your feed tomorrow morning with another very special episode, very special uh, va vacation edition episode. Uh, I hope I am enjoying the beach right now, and I hope you are going to enjoy the rest of your Monday. Uh, while you're listening to this, Leave a like, leave a review, leave a subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Sixpack, and throw down in the comments, what position do you think needs the most work on the Wisconsin Badgers roster this season? Am, am I right about the tight end room? Am I wrong about the defensive line? Do you think there's enough there on the defensive line to, to make up for the injuries to James Thompson Jr.? Or does it not matter because the quarterback's not going to be good enough to get you the wins anyway? Let me know down in the comments below, and thank you for listening to the Scotty Six Pack Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, you can also find me, your host, Kedrick Summers, at Kedrick Summers on the website, formerly known as Twitter. I cover the Wisconsin Badgers for Athlon Sports. Until we talk to you all again tomorrow on Wisconsin.